Okay, I'm going to start recording. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that, Paul. Sure. So I think um, I really don't want to hold us up too much longer. So why don't we just go ahead and um, Adele, why don't you, what you could do is share your link with Darcy, send her yours. She'll just show up as you. Um, if she does, if she can't get in through the attendee address. Oh, I will try that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, but we're going to keep going. We are recording, so she won't miss anything, but hopefully we'll get her in so she'll be able to ask questions at the end if she needs to. Okay, Paul, I'm sorry. You might as well continue. Sure. Um, great. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, what we're looking at here um, is, a, is a tentative schedule for the program launch. This lays out um, a schedule that's about as fast as it could as it could be done, or as launch as quick as possible. And I'll just walk through the dates first and and what's included. So you'll see we first all the way on the left we've divided just the schedule into three big buckets. There's the review and decision making for Valley Green Energy. Then there's the public education period, and then program launch. So into the middle column there, the, the most important thing is to get the utility basic service prices. And that's because as you know, the um, program price gets compared to basic service. We need to get the basic service price on the um, opt-out mailing. And also you'll want to make your decisions about things like how much renewable energy to include once you know what the basic service price is. Um, you guys are covered by two utilities among the three towns. Um, one is Western Mass Electric, as you know, they've already announced just a couple of days ago their basic service price. So we have that. But national grids won't be known until June 19th. So that's a that's a key and, and key start date, initial date for us. So then the next thing to do is to look at what are called indicative bids from electricity suppliers. These are non-binding bids, but they're generally pretty close to where the final bids come out. And What's good about those is you can sort of take time, a little time to review them and think about them. When we get the final bids that come next, um, those, once you get the final bids that you will need to make a decision that day, whether to accept a bid or not uh, and sign the contract that day. So there's not a lot of time for decision-making once you get the final bids. And that's why we do this preliminary um, indicative bid round. Um, as you'll see in the schedule here, just, for thinking about it, we've, we've got that down just like the day after we get the national grid prices. So that would be the day you'd have all the information you would want. Um, and then just in this schedule, we have the final bids a week later. All these things could be pushed out. This is just what a schedule would look like if you went as fast as possible. Um, it's in the accepting the final bids that you'll make the key decisions about the program. And we'll talk more about those later, but things like the price, the percentage of extra renewables, final composition of the products, all that gets decided at that stage. And the shape of the program is then final. So then we move from there into the public education period. And I have just a few of the highlights flagged here, listed here just to show you how things relate. The first thing is a coming soon postcard that's usually roughly three weeks after the contract is signed. That's because it takes a little time to get it get the you know, postcard printed and the mailings ready to go and everything. Um, and then the opt-out notice, which is the formal notice to folks telling them about the program that usually comes a week later. Um, that's then usually followed by public information sessions. Our experience is that th those are most valuable, scheduled about two weeks after the opt-out notice goes in the mail. That's to give a little time you know, to account for possible delays um, in the mail delivery make sure everybody has that notice prior to the information sessions. Um, and then we, we wrap them up maybe a week or so before the opt-out deadline, just because we find attendance really drops off later. People have already made their decision. So we've got them targeted in that middle period there. Um, then we have the opt-out deadline. And then from there, you go to uh, program launch, the supplier processes, the all the opt-outs and then submits the accounts for enrollment with the utility and the, the program begins. Um, we'll go into a few of these in more detail, but let me pause here and ask if there's any there are any questions about this slide and the timeline. 
Yes, Carolyn. Um, so can you remind uh, me or us that um, for the opt-out postcards, are those targeted to the people who are only on basic service? Um, or will there be some information mailed to everyone who isn't just on basic service, who, but other people who have you know, gone over to other suppliers? Yes, great question. So the mailings only go to basic service customers who are the ones who are eligible for automatic enrollment in the program. They're all, they're all tied to that. And yeah. would you envision having a different or more public outreach for those folks who aren't on just basics so that those people can make choices about opting in? Yes. Well, there is, I mean, there is general information, you know, announcements, the banners, if you want to have banners, certainly the public information sessions are um, available to anyone. Um, there'll be things like social media posts, which aren't limited to the basic service customers. It's it's just the mailings that only go to the basic service folks. Um, it's okay. in part because I guess the two reasons for that is one, it's it's only the basic service folks for which we get the the names and addresses tied to the account. So that's they're the ones who get the target mailing. Of course, they have to get a mailing because they are going to get automatically enrolled. Um, and then it is possible to communicate with people not on basic service, but usually that isn't in the form of a mailing. So um, it's not impossible, but the, the supplier's not, not on the hook to pay for that. Um, and those more general mailings are informational, often not a big acceptance rate from a mailing like that too. Paul, I have a question um, as well. You was there a follow up there, Carolyn? Uh, I, uh, no, that answered it. Thanks. Okay, I have Adele. a follow up question. Go ahead. Um, if we wanted to reach out to those people who we know have contracted with an independent supplier, is that okay to do that? And um, and then I have another question as well. Um, yes, it is okay. If it's going to be a mailing, I believe the rule is we need to send it to the Department of Public Utilities in advance, telling them that we're doing it and showing it to them. But yes, it is allowed. Okay. But then, then the cost of that, can, can we follow up that question with the cost of that, though, is not on the supplier? We have to cover that cost, the municipalities? Correct. But you could do social media outreach that doesn't have to go to DPU for sign off. Is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. So um, about a year ago or so, I talked to the Green Energy Consumers Alliance about their green up charge, their green up program. And um, what they said at the time was very confusing. They said, well, oh, well, because you have two different um, uh, utilities and they handle things differently, uh, National Grid, I, I can't remember which direction it was, but National Grid and Eversource handle things differently. And one of them considers that people who are enrolled in the Green Up program uh, need to disenroll in order to be considered part of the aggregation. Yes, that's that's exactly right. And it's it's National Grid that does it that way. So in in Eversource you can be in both an aggregation and in green up, but in National Grid you can't. You can only be in one of the two. And I believe green up customers wouldn't be included in the list that we get to do the uh, mailing to. And the, the list that National Grid provides for the for the that mailing the coming soon and the opt-out notice mailing is only people who would get automatically enrolled and that would be basic service customers, but not people with a competitive supplier. And I'm pretty sure also not people on green up. Okay, so, uh, but we will not be notified how many people and what their addresses are who are on the green up program. Is that correct? I believe that's correct, yes. That's a problem.
how is this dealt with with other communities or in well, your experience paul yeah so i i believe in that um, as i said i'm pretty sure the green up folks for national grid communities are just excluded um it's it's a pretty small percentage of the population most everywhere it may be a larger percentage for you i'm not sure but um generally their uh, greener folks are ex just, ex just excluded because they're treated as if they're on a competitive supply. So it seems that maybe what we would want to do is some kind of outreach through social media or press releases about specifically targeted to those who might be green up customers to alert them. But that's really the only thing we can do. They'd have to self-identify and reach out to participate. But maybe yep. that's a strategy we want to include in our outreach. Adele, does that sound like an okay yes. at least strategy we, to you? We will certainly want to include that as a strategy. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Um, any other questions, Adele, or anyone else? So, Paul, I, I, I just a, oh, oh, go, go ahead, Tom. Ahead, you go first. <laughs> The question I had was just about the timeline. You said, Paul, that um, this is a timeline if we were moving as fast as possible. Is there an advantage to moving faster or uh, rather than maybe, you know, a few weeks out or a month out? Um, what's the advantage to moving quicker with this? Yes. And um, I, I should clarify, I said moving as fast as possible. I really meant starting as soon as possible. So okay. I love the normal amount of time for all the steps, but I just had it start at the earliest possible date. So the advantage to starting earlier is only that, well, you want, I guess, to launch sooner, which is good in and of itself, but it also means that customers are on the basic service rate that's listed in their opt-out letter for longer. So I'll give an extreme case, you wouldn't be in this case, but if we were to do wait until the very end of the basic service period and say, we're sending you a letter and it says the basic service price is X and the program price is Y, but the basic service price we're going to change one month later, that would be, it wouldn't be anything dishonest, but it would be less fair to the customers to be comparing to a price that was going to change in a month anyway. The closer you launch to the beginning of the basic service period, the longer period of time the cost, the, that basic service price you're comparing to would be in effect. It's not a huge issue. You know, we, we can easily move things out a month, two months, whatever works for your schedule. This would just be be starting as soon as we can. So we started as early as possible in the basic service period. Okay. And my understanding is that when we um, are reviewing and securing the final bids, that the executives for each community have to be present or have a designee present at that time? Yes, or I should say, there's no DPU rule about this. It's really, um, it's a Valley Green energy rule. But as I understand your, your MOU, in, important decisions like this would be made of a vote by a vote of your partner's committee. So you'd wanna be able to take a vote of that committee when we look at the bids and it'd be up to you who's you know which individuals are there but the the committee would need to be there so it could vote which would be the staff from each community or the or their executives from each community okay um tom go ahead well just that was actually one of my questions stephanie so it's um uh, getting the schedule in front of the um, appropriate executives is is a good idea, I think, uh, to your point, Stephanie, um, which I assume is going to be in, in what comes out of this meeting. Um, and I had a kind of a more general question going back to what Dell was what what Adele was asking about, which is, do you do we know what percentage of the market is? on basic service versus a competitive supplier? How big of a, I assume you must have a, some some sense in order to put the um, bid together, uh, request for pricing. Um, yeah, so we, well, we can figure it out, I guess, indirectly. So what we get is we get detailed information about all the customers on basic service. 
and we mm -hmm. get no information about the others. So we can look to have a person from the, we can kind of figure out how many customers are on competitive supply. If we can get from the utility, you know, a total number of accounts in the town typically, so we could see what percentage is in what we got. Um, mm -hmm. And also I think the, the attorney general issues a report on the number of customers on competitive supply by town, I'm pretty sure. So we could, we could look at that too. So we do have a sense for the bid itself, what the suppliers really care about is the, as you would know, is the load they're bidding to serve. So mm -hmm. if there are other customers in the town who aren't part of it, they don't worry about that so much. They worry of about course. they're gonna they're gonna serve. So it'll be a tight, relatively. T I mean, you've done this before. It's been done before, but between June twentieth and the week of June twenty fifth, um, we need to kind of be on on watch. Um, yes, or the, or we'll decide what you, we'll create the schedule, and then it, it'll of course be that, yep. be that period. I'll say. Um, there's no particular advantage to having a lot of time between the indicative bids and the final bids. What you want to have is a discussion of the indicative bids and be able to make your decisions. But generally speaking, you know, you, you make the decisions in the meeting um, and then you can do the final bids just sometime after that. The closer they are in time, the less difference, the less risk there is that the final prices could be different from the indicatives, could be meaningfully diff different. They're all always different a tiny bit. Um, but it's, you know, it's very common to do it one week later. It's common to do it two weeks later. Many towns even have a bigger gap than that. But there's not so really so much an advantage to that gap. It was more they just didn't get things scheduled up, you know, well enough ahead of time. So, Paul, I would want to um, just put out to the group then that this is a tentative schedule because I think we need to check in with our executives as well to see what they're comfortable with in terms of the timeline and the time between reviewing the indicative bids and then um, convening to determine the final bids that we would want to um, choose or go with. So, um, and typically, you know, because I'm not familiar with this uh, process in terms of the bids, um, is that something that would be in private session because it wouldn't be in public because, so it might be just the executives and staff uh, for just the final bid decision. We could have the indicative bid meeting in public like, you know, like this meeting would be sort of a regular meeting of the group, but with the final bids, um, we could have a meeting with the group. And then when it comes time for the final bids, the executives would have had the benefit of having conversation with the group or getting feedback from the group. And then they can make their final decision. Um, yes, I guess we're with just one friendly amendment. So for the, the actual indicative bids, we would want to keep those actual bids confidential too. And, and the reason for keeping both those and the final bids confidential, it, it's not for the town's benefit or secrecy benefit. It's that we don't want the suppliers to know what each other is bidding because that might result in worse prices for the town. So that's why you want to keep those prices quiet. That applies to both the indicatives and the final. But if you wanted to have um, a more public discussion of the indicative, like the indicative bids, we could prepare, um, if you will, representative bids. So it would give you all the information you needed to be making decisions like how much extra renewables, how much that would cost, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. just without revealing the very specific prices that specific suppliers bid which isn't really needed for that conversation anyway. So we could maybe do it in two parts. One of it's more public discussion, have it just be representative bids, not without the suppliers identified, round them off a little bit, just so it doesn't um, reveal the information that's better kept public, but would still allow um, a robust discussion of the decisions that you need to make. And then, and then the second would be the actual decision-making. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, 
Yeah, sorry. I just have one more question about um, the education and the outreach. If um, if people um, if the word is out now that um, people could go back to basic service before June, does that mean then they would be automatically put in the into the postcard mailing if they did it ahead of time? I mean, it, so in other words, does it? Does the does it become effective immediately if I call up National Grid and say I'm no longer want to be green up I want to go back to basic? Um, sadly, no. So changes like that only take effect on a, on the customer's meter read date, which is only one day a month. Um, okay. It has to be you have to make the request at least a few days before that to be effective. But it's also the case since we're only if we're working on a schedule like this it would be too late for customers to get on that initial mailing list. Okay. It's already too late because those lists are already being generated by okay. the grid. But no, okay. we do we do mailings over the course of the year, about once a quarter, to catch uh -huh. new customers who've moved into town. And similarly, uh -huh. who dropped off basics off of competitive supply onto basic service, they would get caught up in that next one. So they wouldn't be in Got the first it. one, but they might be in a mailing in a few months. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on this schedule? Okay. All right, great, I'll move on. And this was the hardest slide. So there's the, with the most information. So it's good that we spent a bunch of time on, on this one. So here I've listed the, the key decisions that you'll make and, and to make the point, they really get made as part of accepting a bid. So that determines, um, I, except for the last one, but the, it determines the price, how much customers are gonna pay. It determines the term of, that's when you decide the term of the contract. Is it a two month, two year contract? Is it a three year contract? That's when you determine the amount of additional renewable electricity in standard green. That's when you decide that. It's also what determines the launch date because the launch date will be in the contract as well. So all those things are part of the contract. I did add and and the, the, this note at the bottom, you know, because they all, the final decisions are made on the day the bids come in, better to be thinking about those and be prepared for those through looking at indicative prices and things as we said. The one question, although I've listed it with the others, which is actually in a different category, is whether to offer the VGE local uh, product at program launch. That's a slightly separate discussion, which we can have right now, but first I'll say like, was it clear about what I was saying before about the, the key things that gets decided as part of the contract? Great. So the. The issue on the VGE local, so that's an, an extra product that you've included in your plan that would be supplied by local renewable resources. We put that in the plan as something that you intended to do, but that may or may not be available at program launch. So now you know, is the time to start thinking about whether you want to do that at launch or that's something more you would want to spend some time and more time with an add-in later. Um, if you wanted to offer it at launch, I think what we'd be looking at would be a product that had all recs from local projects. And we could definitely include that in the RFP and ask suppliers to bid it. And then you could decide based on the bids, whether it seemed like a useful thing for you to offer um, or not, or we this may be something we want to dig into further to identify really what the goals are and, and what the specifics are that you'd be looking for from that from that product. Does that market exist now? Is is that something that uh, suppliers are are packaging at this time? Um, that's a really great question because the answer is basically no, you know, suppliers now offer a class one rec product and they, mm -hmm. they like the flexibility just to buy whatever recs they can come up with. And they're not, 
really focused on the difference between a wreck from a resource that might be near you and a wreck mm -hmm. some other place that still qualifies for class one. So that you're, you really put your finger on the key issue here. Um, and though, I mean, and so I'm not sure exactly what would happen if we included this in the RFP. I think what we might do, if you were interested in giving it a try, is we could talk to them about it and see ahead of time whether they thought this was something they could bid. Um, Kim, let me ask you, would that make sense as an approach that we could talk to some suppliers in advance and see if they, they would feel comfortable bidding something like this? Yes, that's certainly something I can ask them in advance. Um, <clears throat> so this would be um, like a fourth product. Is that okay? Um, and when you say all recs, that's not just voluntary. It would be the required ones as well, or no? Those. Um, that's a great question too. I would think just the voluntaries. Okay. Do that, but the yes, because the compliance recs they have to buy for their entire portfolio is not specific right. to the project. I know you knew that, but just to say it for the group, so. It wouldn't be so make make so much sense to specify the compliance regs. Uh, Carolyn has a question, and then Adele. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I think I understood you to say <laughs> that if we forego it um, at launch, the next opportunity to look at that would be our next bid, which would be in a year. Is that correct? A year or two years? Yeah. So it would be for okay. the down the road. Yes. Oh, every time the term it, it comes up. So if we and uh, negotiate a two-year term uh, that for those pricing, then it wouldn't be for two years. Um, but that would also give us time to explore more and identify what the goals would be for local. Okay, thank you. And Adele? I'm under the impression that locally produced recs are already accounted for by the local producers that they that they've already um entered into those contracts um so let me make sure i understand your question are you saying that the, the people who own the local resources have already sold those recs under contract so they don't have recs to sell exactly and, um that there's certainly there's for sure a bunch of that um we would find out maybe more about what's available um if we asked but i it, it, it's certainly true that probably a lot of the local ones are already committed um you know we don't know the terms of those so they might be committed like through the next year but you know not the year after that um uh so we'd have we'd have to see i think Part of the goal of this product was to create a mechanism to encourage more local projects to be built. Um, that's that becomes that's a more ambitious thing to do because it's one thing to buy recs from projects that are already there. If you're trying to buy recs from future things, that becomes more complicated. Maybe a a great thing to work on, but that would be a harder thing to do right out of the box. That would be more something. We can work on over the next year or so, and then get ready to get ready to add in. Andrew, you have a question. Oh, sorry, Paul. Did you have more to say? Yes, I was just going to say one thing, and I was going to offer a slight qualification to my answer earlier to Carolyn, which is, it's not impossible that we could have a contract with a supplier that had three products didn't include the local. But if then if we could figure out how local might work over the next year, it's not impossible we could get the supplier to amend the contract to add the local. It would be a negotiation at that point, not a requirement, but it definitely would not be an impossible thing to achieve. Andra? Um, I understand that it's more complicated to put together uh, this particular package, but um, is there any <clears throat> downside in asking for it to see what they come up with? Great question. No, there's no downside to asking. In particular, I think the way we would frame it, just to take, give the next sentence, I think we wouldn't frame it as, um, if we were uncertain what they would be able to provide, we would probably frame it as an optional product, meaning you wouldn't be limited to accepting a bid from somebody who provided such a product that you could 
you could take a bid from someone who just offered three or someone who offered all four, and then you could evaluate how useful you thought the fourth was. So you maintain maximum flexibility for you while still getting the ideas and, and learning what the suppliers could offer um, in this area. Adele, go ahead. We're, we're talking now about RECs, but um, what about the actual electricity? For example, I know that there's there is an allowance um, that you, aggregations can purchase electricity generated by wind turbines. Um, is that will that be um, something that we can specify uh, in the RFP? Yes. Um, generally, it's almost always the case that the recs and electricity are sold separately. And what the aggregations and everybody else are specifically buying is Rex plus generic electricity. So, and people are kind of um, often not super precise in how they talk about it, but that's how the market gen that's how the market generally works. In fact, even if you have a contract with a generator, say you have a contract for electricity from a wind turbine, from a wind somebody who owns a wind turbine. Generally, that contract only requires that they provide you with the recs and electricity in the quantities you bought. And if it comes from their wind turbine, great. But if their wind turbine breaks down, they can replace it with some other electricity just as long as they deliver the electricity. But the, the bigger point is really the market is rec, two things, recs, which specify you know a specific generator, a specific place, specific time, and generic electricity where it's all this, where it's all the same. Other questions regarding this slide? Andra? Oops. Um, again, the, the local um, option may take time to, to, to develop, but um, it seems like we could work with local solar developers to identify um, new products um, that are, you know, new projects that are going to come online and have them provide information to those owners. Do some of the background work ourselves. Uh, yes. Tom, oh, sorry, did you have a response to uh, that, Paul? I was I was just making an affirmative response. Okay. And Tom? Yeah, I, I, I'm i just observing that one of the questions that I got at the town meeting was that uh, there there is actual opposition to certain um, proposed projects in the Valley so that we don't have to address it here, but I'm just putting a footnote that that might become part of um, what that product uh, profile looks like uh, um, once we get to that point. But I, I like the idea of exploring and um, understanding it better and, and uh, making a more informed decision downstream a little bit. So, Tom, are you saying including it and then making the decision to build it later? I'm saying... Um, for, uh, I think basically what I'm saying is, you know, exploring the idea of even, you know, the existing, because it sounds like this product does not exist per se at this time. Um, and that I'm uh, open to what I heard us, was Paul's suggestion that we, you know, and, and Andra, that if we can get some information through the bid process, great. Um, Let's see about negotiating something. Um, there's some homework that we would have to do, again, as Andrew points out. Um, but I'm also mentioning that one of the questions, one of the concerns I got um, uh, at Town Hall was that they, uh, one of the um, residents did not want to have uh, projects that are cutting down forests as part of any local offer. So it just might influence um, you know, what the product looks like as, as we um, go through the process here. I, I think that's true on our end too, in terms of 
potential opposition mm -hmm. for certain projects. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So maybe a way just um, on this one, why don't um, Kim and I just kind of reach, just got to gather more information. Kim and I will reach out to the suppliers and just ask, if we were to ask for this, what would you, could you bid something? If so, what would it look like? And then we can just report back that information to you and, and you can make a more, uh, you can think about it more, but then, then decide later with a little bit more information than we have now without committing that, that it's going to be included because of pros and cons. Great. Um, I'm mindful of the time. So I'm just going to move up a, a bit faster if I can. So here I just wanted to identify the, the steps of the procurement process. So we're really here all the way on the left now, which is scheduling these meetings. And that's really the critical thing at this stage, it seems, because we, we just want to lay out the schedule. We don't want to have the first meeting and only then try to schedule the second one. We, ought to, we want to have a set of sort of decide on the dates now. Once the meetings are set, um, the two things that just mentioned quickly, one is we'll send you a memo, just the, the firms we expect to bid, you know, outlining their, their qualifications. That's just information for review. Similarly, we'll send you the um, supply contracts. You'll recall there's a standard aggregation supply contract, which was reviewed at the very beginning. We had to file it with the DPU, it was reviewed um, at that time. The way the bids always work is each supplier can, takes what are called exceptions to the contracts, which are minor things usually related to their business practices. Um, we'll send you all those so you'll have them in advance. That happens with every every contract like this. Um, and then we have that indicative price review meeting and then the, the final the executive price uh, review meeting and then the, the contract signing that day if you decide to accept, accept a bid. Um, the so the the key thing is as I said scheduling these meetings. The two the indicative one you can kind of do any time any time of the day any day whatever is convenient for you. And then the executable one is more structured. Um, we like to do it Tuesdays and Wednesdays because the market electricity markets are quietest those days. We like to do them at noon because we need to get the bids in in the morning. We need to compile them and we can present them to you at noon. Um, in an organized way, and then there's time afterwards to get the contract signed to go through that process. So that's a more sort of specific timing on that. Um, the key issues to think about, which, um, you know, Stephanie, you, you raised earlier, which is, you know, who should attend these meetings, the indicative round and the final round. Um, and then are any additional meetings required? So you know, is it just these meetings we've been talking about, which is, you know, maybe one meeting with a broader group with the indicatives or uh, more narrow meeting for the bid day? Or is there anything else like, you know, are there's, does there need to be a meeting with, uh, you know, with a select board or something to, to go over this question? So that's, that's something to work out. And then finally, just to be sure we're, we're all set that on the bid day, someone has the authority to sign the contract and that's going to flow from your the MOU um, between the towns but we we'll want to we'll want to be sure we know in advance that whatever steps need to happen there are happened so that you the, the, you guys are in a position to to make a decision and sign the contract that day um so because of my obsession with scheduling these meetings I'm going to pause here and just ask how how should we go forward? Like, what would be the next best steps to getting these meetings scheduled and like figuring out who needs to be there and getting them on the calendar, things like that? Well, Paul, I think I would probably work with the other two communities, but I think we want to check in with our executives. And um, personally, I'm thinking of taking your slides and the recording of this meeting today and forwarding them to the town manager so he can review um, and then following up with him and sort of seeing the timeline that he thinks might work. Um, so I don't know if we want to have maybe a follow-up meeting with executives to ask additional questions, maybe. I don't know how the others feel, uh, other communities feel about that. 
I mean, I think that um, I can check in with the mayor and see if she or someone from the mayor's office wants to be participate in the um, pricing um, review and bidding review. But I, I, um, I can. I, my sense would be that if we report, if I report back, that. Um, I can just get answers question uh, questions answered directly through you guys um, or through Stephanie um, without having to set up an extra meeting. Um, this is between now and first week of June is going to be. Um, there's no time for the mayor's office to participate in any of these conversations because it's budget <laughs> um, review season. So um, I think. But I I do think that um, it would be and and that we would probably be best suited to figure out a timeline a calendaring um, schedule between the three of us probably makes sense um, and I can get some dates from the mayor's office for um, those days in June at the end of June and I think we want to include staff availability as well yeah. I'm good with that plan. I would just want to make sure, you know, the uh, chair of the select board and the energy committee are aware of it and sharing the slide deck gets that done. So that, that's good for me. And the recording, I'll be, I'll send the link of this yes, recording. Exactly. I mean, it's always available, but I'll send it. I don't normally, but I will this time just to make sure that we can share it with um, folks that would be involved in this process. Anybody else have any questions? So Paul, at least right now, it sounds like we wouldn't have any additional meetings quite yet um, unless something comes up. Um, and I think the one thing will be about the timeline. I think I'd maybe want to do a, a doodle poll. So maybe the dates that you presented, the tentative schedule, we could start there, but maybe have some um, additional dates and times as well. Yes, and um, would it be would it be helpful if we helped with that? We gave you some additional suggestions, Stephanie, or do sure. You, um, yeah. So we could certainly do that. And I, I and I and I do want to emphasize one one really important point, which is I had to set out some schedule, so I set out a schedule that just began as fast as possible and moved through it. But certainly, our goal here is to have a schedule that's comfortable for, for Valley Green Energy in its decision-making. So whatever schedule is comfortable for you, that's the schedule we're gonna have. The one I put forward is just a starting point to start thinking about how the schedule, you know, what the schedule looks like. Um, I think for us, the, I'm sorry, Stephanie, was there anything else to talk about on this topic? Uh, not, not for me, unless anybody else had anything. I don't think not so. Not on the scheduling. Yeah. Um, All good. The, the final slide I have here was just an overview of the public education. You, you'll recall we, as part of the DPU filing, we prepared a detailed education and outreach plan, which goes through a lot of the steps in greater detail than I than I put on the early right. the, earlier slide. Um, and then a lot of the content, as we talked about, really flows from the decisions you make when you accept a price fit, because that determines the price and the amount of renewables and everything else. So you can't be moving forward with anything until those decisions are made, except that you can, like, once you make those decisions, even though public education period doesn't start for three, four weeks or so, there's some things that are good to get started on early once the decisions are made. And that includes, you know, like, Again, scheduling the public information yeah. session, getting the postcard designed and everything else. So that's all for down the road after the after the pricing meetings. I just wanted to, to lay that out for today. And if I could add that the postcard content and design, that's something that we help with. So we can send you an example of what that coming soon postcard looks like typically for other communities. So you can use that as inspiration and then we would take your content and send it over to a, a good professional designer, make it look good. Great. Thank you.
and, and on this topic, I should have done a reminder of what the coming soon postcard is. So the, the main mailing to customers is the opt-out notice, which comes you know in an envelope for the town. The coming soon postcard is just to give people a heads up that that's coming because it's an important mailing. We don't want people to miss it. So send them this preliminary postcard to say, hey, look, this thing's coming in the mail. Watch out for it. And in the postcard, you can put a little bit about the program too. At what would we, thank you, Stephanie. Um, at what point would we ask people whether the, they want to opt up to a 100% renewable? That comes, great question. So that comes um, as part of the, the opt-out notice or the automatic enrollment notification that both tells them that the program, tells them the program's happening and tells them here are your three choices or here are three for whatever choice the number of choices you have. And here's how to exercise one of those choices. So opt up, you know, what would everyone really explain how to do that? Um, so it comes at it comes at that stage. And if I, I can build on what Paul said, so the notice is the thing that gets everyone's attention because it winds up in their mailbox. So people look at that. But as soon as you've signed your supply contract, you can put out a press release. And in fact, you have an obligation to put in an announcement. And so that's really, as soon as you've got that contract signed, you can start talking to the public because then you know what things are going to cost, you know, how much extra renewables in your default, you know, all of that. So the opt-out notice is a powerful tool because it lands in people's mailboxes, but you can start and you will start talking to the public before that goes out because you want to get a press release out first to provide a little air cover. You're going to need to put something on your municipal website. So when people get that notice and they're like, is this legit? They go to your municipal site, they see the same announcement there. Oh, it's real. So you'll be able to start talking about that stuff when you sign the contract, once you've got the information. But Paul's right that the opt-out notice is the thing that provides people with the concrete details. And also it has a phone number, a website address for taking a step for opting up if they wish to. But the notice itself is not an opt-up campaign. So it's a notice about automatic enrollment. So if you want to talk specifically about opting up, social media is a great way to do that. You know, other types of outreach you may want to do in the community are a great way to do that. Great, thank you, Marlena. Any other questions? I have one question, um, and this is probably either down the road. Um, and just a reminder, I guess, for me, um, are, will we get data from how many people have signed, you know, each period have signed up and then also their consumption rates and who those individuals are um, um, uh, so that we can have that to be able to target, you know, weatherization or other efficiency upgrades if we wanted to do that? Oh, so that's a really good question. So all that data is available. So prior to launch, we have data about historic electricity use for all eligible customers. And then once they're in the program, we get on a monthly basis reports from the suppliers about how many customers for each customer who's participating, how much they use and everything. Um, the Generally speaking, but this is entirely up to you. So generally speaking, sometimes there's tons vary in how much they want to see that data in detail about individual customers versus just seeing aggregate numbers. So all towns see okay. aggregate numbers and then you can make decisions about how much of the detailed customer specific information you want. And then you can make decisions about how you use the data. There are some limitations on how you use it. So you couldn't use it for unrelated purposes, which I know you wouldn't, but I just to put it out there, but then we yeah. could have a detailed discussion about whether, you know, you can use it to target or just to help inform customers about other municipal programs that might be useful for them. Mm -hmm. okay. Paul, could each community tailor the information that they would like to receive? And I, I, I think we're working together, but I'm just wondering if some, in some cases, if a, a community is not comfortable with getting more detailed information, can it vary? Yes. 
Okay. Andra. I just want to say that um, our organization, Local Energy Advocates, is interested in helping to coordinate the um, outreach to community, doing tabling and whatever, um, speaking at organizations and such, and, and helping to coordinate any other volunteer organizations that want to be involved. Well, that, that's great, and that can be as you know, extremely effective. So it's wonderful to, to know that you're available to do that. Great. Any last um, comments from you, Paul, before we adjourn? Okay. Yeah. And any more questions from everybody? And everyone's all set? Okay. This was enormously helpful. And Paul, if you could um, send me those slides because I do need to publicly post them as well. That would be great. And um, I will follow up with uh, you, Paul, specifically about potential uh, timeline alternative dates. And then I will send those out to the communities. And um, I think from there, we'll then look to schedule our first, our next meeting based on response from the, the choice of dates. And in the meantime, Thank if there you. are any questions, please feel free to to send them to me and I'll get them to Paul. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Very exciting. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. All right. Bye all.